Welcome to the Des Moines Storytellers Project. Thank you so much for being here to celebrate a night of live storytelling with us for our seventh season. Tonight's theme is community. We here at the Storytellers Project believe sharing our stories builds community, and we wanted to hear how others celebrate theirs. We hope you'll find a deeper connection to yourself and those around you after tonight's event. So please join me in turning off your cell phone and getting lost in these stories. Our first storyteller tonight is Jim Sayers, who will share a story about finding community in an unexpected place. Have you ever been inside of a prison? My first time was about seven years ago, Fort Dodge Correctional Facility. The first time I went in the place, what amazed me most was the beautifully polished, shining cement floors. I could see my reflection. Then I looked around and I saw stark white walls, bright lights everywhere, echoing hallways, a very cold and uninviting place. As I looked around, I saw some guards scattered through the facility, but everyone else was dressed alike. And I thought, well, yeah, they're all prisoners. Maybe they are all alike. Tonight's theme is community. And the first time I thought of community, I thought of where I was from, and where everyone like me was pretty much alike. But my story tonight is about a community in which everyone was not like me. It was a, a community that I found different from where I grew up. I'm from Humboldt, rural Humboldt County, Iowa, about two, mile, or two uh, hours northwest of here. My community, when I grew up, I would say is pretty... Uh, homogenous. I would say that uh, diversity in that community was whether you were a Kiwanis Club member or a Lions Club member, <laughs> or whether you were a member of the Baptist or Lutheran or Methodist or congregational churches. Uh, pretty much everyone in my community growing up had a mother, a father, and two to three children. Everyone's skin color was pretty much alike. I'm sort of embarrassed tonight to admit that my first conversation in my life with a person of color did not happen until I was a freshman at Iowa State University. Bessie Hall, biology lecture, the professor asked us all to turn in our books and look at some, uh, something in the textbook. A young black woman was sitting to my right. She turned and said, I forgot my book. Can I look on with you? I said, yes. Tonight, my story is about a community I found at the Changing Winds Toastmasters Club at the Fort Dodge Correctional Facility. Well, how did I get there anyway? I was a prison volunteer. Uh, for many years, my friend in Humboldt, whose name was also Jim, had been inviting me to come with, he, with him and his uh, church group to go lead worship services at the Fort Dodge prison every Wednesday night. And finally, I said, oh, I guess I can go. I was sort of curious. I thought it might be sort of interesting. So I said, yes. Well, the first night I went to the prison, I was informed that you must dress a certain way if you are a prison volunteer. You are not to wear blue jeans or a gray sweatshirt. <laughs> Why is that? Well, because that is what the inmates wore in the wintertime. And if you wore that as a volunteer, you might be mistaken for one of the residents and have a hard time getting out afterwards. <laughs> Up to this time, my expectations for what was prison like had been entirely based on TV shows like Oz or movies like Shawshank Redemption or Escape from Alcatraz. Prisons and prisoners were scary. You could trust no one inside and it was dangerous. Well, tonight I cannot tell you how prisons are everywhere, but I can tell you from my perspective, never once did I fear, feel fearful or nervous when I went to the Fort Dodge prison. Well, I went with Jim and his group a few weeks, and every week as we went down this long hallway traveling to the room where the church service was held, I passed by a big window in the hall. It was about four foot high by six foot wide, and so I stopped one evening and I peered through the window glass 
And I looked into a small room on the other side where it appeared everybody was having a good time. They were laughing, they were clapping, they were standing up and down, and I thought, what's going on in there? That looks like a lot of fun. I looked on the window on the lower level and it said, Changing Winds Toastmasters Club, meetings Wednesday nights, 6.30. I thought this looked like a lot more fun than the church group. <laughs> I want to join this group. So I inquired to the prison staff. They connected me with the volunteer coordinator for the Toastmasters Club. And I learned from her that Toastmasters is an international organization which focuses on, focuses on helping its uh, members become better at communication and leadership. And they do this by having the members give speeches uh, at the meetings and following those by evaluations of those speeches by other members. I learned that we're, there's only a handful of Toastmasters clubs in prison across this country. Well, the coordinator invited me to come to a Toastmasters meeting. My first Toastmasters meeting was February 15th, 2017. I walked into the room and I looked around and I thought, there are more tattoos per square inch of skin in this room than I have seen in my whole life. I was a newbie, but immediately I felt welcomed and respected. Several people came up and introduced themselves to me, and everyone shook your hand. Then the meeting started, and as soon as the members started speaking, I realized how excellent they were in their speaking skills. The president, whose name was James, was especially articulate and eloquent in how he ran the meeting. I sat there in my little chair in front of the room thinking, boy, I was sure wrong about this place. Here I thought I was going to be coming in being the expert, helping these young men become better speakers, and I suddenly realized I'm going to learn more here than they will ever learn from me. As they went around the room and they asked me to introduce myself, I sat there in the front row actually speechless. I was intimidated, not because I was afraid, but because they were so darn good. The meeting was fun. I was invited to come back the next week, which I did. I was invited to become a member, which I did, and I soon they started calling me the club mentor, probably because of my age. <laughs> but I found myself looking forward to every Wednesday night to go to that meeting. For me, it became sort of uh, like a family reunion. You could catch up from everyone on the, what they'd done the week before and, and what was happening. And also, my job, I thought, was to help provide a little window to the world outside. Well, I don't know what I thought. You know, you volunteer at prison, you just come up at the front door and say, hello, can I come visit tonight? No, I learned to respect the security in the prison system and a lot of it's like when you check in at an airport, you know, the metal detector for the people and the x-ray for your baggage and your shoes and your coats. It's a lot like that. But the prison is different in that there are, at Fort Dodge anyway, four heavy locked steel doors, one locked iron gate. Each one opens with a buzz, closes with a clank, separating freedom from the prisoners. I discovered, as a Toastmasters member at Fort Dodge, that when you speak to a bunch of inmates, you literally have a captive audience. <laughs> and I thought, you know, I didn't come here to find a community. I was just curious, but I certainly felt a very strong sense of belonging. And even though these club members now, all dressed alike in their gray sweatshirts, they were not all alike. We had older members in our club, some who had been in prison many, many years, some who were lifers and may likely never leave the building. We also had young members who seemed like kids to me. We had skin colors of all colors in our club. Uh, some of our members were from small towns, rural areas, some from cities, some from other states. Some were even from other countries. 
Why was that? Because they had made the mistake of committing a crime in Iowa. From those members, I learned a lot about their culture and the places that they were from. And the stories. Now, I know we're here at a storyteller's night, so probably you, most of you will agree with me that stories help bring people together because they can let us share experiences and situations that we could not experience ourselves. That was exactly how I felt going to my Toaster Masters meeting, listening to the speeches every week. One gentleman talked about growing up with his family and literally living under a bridge when they were homeless. Another member talked about being split from his sibling at a young age and having to be shuffled between multiple foster homes his entire childhood. Many members talked about growing up without having any stable adult in their life. Interestingly to me, very few talked about their criminal background or why they even got into prison, uh, except for Scotty. Scotty liked to tell us about his escapades with law enforcement, <laughs> including how he was involved in a high-speed police chase from the perspective of the person being chased. But well, most of the speeches and uh, discussions, stories from the members were about family, about hopes and dreams for the future. And I found myself often going home on Wednesday nights feeling uplifted and inspired by the stories that I had heard. Wait, did I say prison was a cold place? Perhaps it was outside of that little Toastmasters room, but within that room there was warmth and kindness. We had service dogs, usually about three or four or five dogs who joined us every meeting. These were service dogs being trained by the inmates that then would be sent out to serve people across the country. We often enjoyed cookies or cupcakes shared by the culinary arts class. James, the president I just mentioned, was one of many members who were, was taking classes offered by Iowa Central Community College there at the prison. James would come excitedly every week and give me an update about what he had learned in supply chain management, carpentry, or welding. Another member, David, learned that we both love coffee. Soon, every meeting when I arrived, I would have a freshly brewed cup of coffee from David sitting on my table in the back of the room. In the summer of 2017, my mother passed away in August. I still remember the first meeting I went to after that had happened, receiving the warmest and kindest and most loving hugs from my members that I had received from anyone. Thomas, a club member, had lost his own mother while he was incarcerated. He never got the chance to say goodbye in person. And I always wondered, how did that feel for him? Well, Toastmasters, I continued attending as a member for weeks and then months and then actually a few years. I loved my group. I loved going to the meetings. We had banquets. We had graduations. We had celebrations, all sorts of things. And after a while, I started thinking of these people not as my members, but my guys. But then, 2020 came, along with COVID. COVID, along with some other instances of prison violence around that same time, led Iowa prison officials to cease all prison visits by volunteers. I might add that that has continued even till today. My in-prison, in-person community ended. But my story did not end. Thankfully, I had made some connections in my prison community that I've been able to continue on with some of my members as they have transitioned out of incarceration. Thomas, who I just mentioned, was released actually during the COVID time. I remember Thomas spent his first winter trekking across town over two miles by foot to his first job. Thomas and his girlfriend, 
moved to the city about two years ago, and last year they invited me to come and officiate at their wedding. Also, Thomas and his wife now had a baby just early this year, and they are starting their new life together as a family. David, the, the coffee guy, David got released to a halfway house just shortly before this past Christmas. I experienced with David the challenges he faced in finding employment, finding multiple doors closed because he is a felon. I'm very proud of David, however, because already he has started online classes to work toward his bachelor's degree. He's a writer. He wrote a book while he was in prison, and he's also started his own Substack column. James, the gentleman I mentioned as the president, is scheduled to be released soon. James looks forward to starting his life over on the outside with his family over in eastern Iowa. Well, I'm not naive enough to think there are no bad people in the world. Everyone is in prison for a reason, and some of those reasons are pretty horrible. Not everyone wants to be or will be rehabilitated. In Iowa, the recidivism rate, I learned, is about 33%. Is that good or not? I don't know. But what that means is when Iowa prisoners get out of prison, about a third of them will go back again after committing crimes and sometimes back multiple times. Yet, but on the other hand, I'm not cynical enough either to believe that people cannot change if they are given another chance. Your future does not have to be defined by the worst of your past. I believe that for my guys, and I, I believe it for me as well. Today I feel so fortunate that I was walking down that hall, looked through that big window in the Fort Dodge prison all those years ago, and was invited to join the community on the other side. That community has enriched my life. Thank you. Thank you, Jim, for sharing about your change of heart. Next up is Erlen Kakanad, who will share a story about embracing her authentic self. Mama, why am I brown? My world spun so fast when my five-year-old asked me that question. It was a beautiful spring morning, and I was at the preschool pickup line, typically the favorite part of my day. I would stand outside the school doors, watch these preschoolers wave goodbye to their teacher, and then my son would run so fast towards me and give me one of the tightest hug, best part of my work day. But that day, he had a question. He did not run toward me and barely hug me. His question threw me in a spiral of emotion and chaos in my mind. I wondered, was he being bullied? Did someone say something to him that hurt him? Was he othered? Was he excluded? And is he feeling like he does not belong? I was angry, I was confused. It felt as though this mama bear three times my size was just taking over me when she sensed that her baby bear is under attack. The muscles on my face felt so heavy, the knot in my throat. I took a deep breath, rolled back those tears and asked him, what happened? And he said, Mama, I want to be beige like my best friend. His friend in preschool. So that night, I wanted to learn about where these questions were coming from. And what I learned was it was coming from this innocent place of curiosity about why he looked different from others in his classroom. But I started to see that his self-esteem was lowering. 
and I wanted him to feel that he belonged in every space that he went in. So that night at bedtime, I invited both my boys, my three-year-old and my five-year-old, and I told them stories about every brown character that we knew about. We talked about movies, Encanto, Coco. I also told them stories about my proud Indian heritage, stories about India. My son became more curious, and he asked me, Mama, are all people in India brown like me? So that night I tucked him to bed, told my kids good night, I went downstairs, and I did what every infuriated mom would do. I took all my questions and took it to Google. <laughs> yep. Yes, I was desperate that night for answers, for resources, for books. So I Googled. I Googled for children's books that told stories about Asian Indian brown skin that had brown characters or had stories about the Indian heritage. I was sad to find 10 books in the global market, but I ordered them all. That night, I thought very deeply about race and ethnicity. I knew that I, would have to ha I had to have the race conversation with my kids growing up here in Iowa at some point, but I didn't know that it would be at such a young age. I was unprepared. I knew what to say, but I just didn't know how to say it. Still feeling unsettled that night, I turned to all the books that we had in our own collection for our children at home. I was surprised to find that our own book collection lacked diversity and had no representation of people of color. That pulled back the curtains for me and the harsh reality that my son, he does not see himself in these books or in his classroom. My son wants to blend in. And I thought, of course he wants to blend in. Because I have been trying to blend in and I'm trying to be with my, like my white peers and I've been living in this own box of my own creation. You see, 10 years ago, I immigrated to the United States and I stepped into corporate America. Early on in my career days, I got feedback about what's, what I should say, what, what I should do, and how I should behave in order to be successful and climb up this corporate ladder. You know those appraisal conversations that went like, Erlen, it's not the what, it's the how. So I emulated it. I remember in those early days, I was trying to look, shop for clothes to wear to work, and I was surprised, my first cultural shock, as to why there are so many plain blacks and grays in Dillard's and in Yonkers. <laughs> I was so used to the custom-made outfits, bright colors, gold embroideries, glitters, but everyone at work wore those plain blacks and grays. So I emulated and I bought all those dull suits. I also remember early on, I used to be very afraid to take my Indian food to lunch, to work. I would never eat at my cubicle. I would wait till everyone used the lunchroom to go and warm up my food. I did not want to be judged because of how my food smelled or looked. I did not want to be hurt by other people's opinions. And I did not want to offend anybody because of my food. I also tried the American food. It was just too much of bread and cheese for my liking. So every day I felt like I was leaving my true self at the door every time I walked into the office. 
And after spending so many hours, days, months, and years in this unauthentic, impersonated version of myself, I forgot who the true, authentic Erlen was. So that night, when I told my son that he belonged in every space he went in, I was preaching to him something that I was not following myself. I felt like a hypocrite. So that night, I sat down and I journaled my thoughts, the stories, and the positive affirmations that I told my son at bedtime because I knew that we would have to say those to ourselves over and over again. So I decided that I am going to take this transformation journey along with my son. So I started showing up in bright colors and leftovers in my lunch, lunch box. And the people in my work, they welcomed me. I was included and it gave me this different level of confidence and happiness. And with that renewed happiness and confidence, I thought to myself, what if I can help somebody else out there in my community, another child, a brown kid, help them celebrate their authenticity, celebrate themselves? So that night, what I journaled, months later, became my first best-selling, award-winning children's book. I titled the book, Happy in Your Skin, Is Rafa Different? It was based on a character named Rafa, child of Indian immigrants growing up in the Midwest. <laughs> and I remember, before the book was published, I got the electronic proof copy of the book. And so I open up my laptop, I invite both my sons, and we sit behind the laptop, and I start reading the story. I didn't tell them that I wrote the book. So as I read the story about Rafa, my son turned to a, turns towards me and says, Mama, this boy, Rafa, he's just like me. <laughs> but in that moment, I realized that this was the first book that resonated with him and the book that he connected with. So of course, they got my first signed copy. <laughs> Few months later, after I published the book, I was invited and spotlighted at the Des Moines Book Festival. We had a table there, and many families stopped at our table to hear our story and take a look at our book. Some families also shared their own story. One family told me about how their child had these race and ethnic curiosities at a very young age, and then when it went, went unaddressed, they started to cut ties with their ethnic selves. There were also some food conversations. One, one parent told me that her son stopped taking burritos to lunch. Another parent told me that she started noticing that her daughter would not touch her lunch. And her daughter said that the other kids would make fun of how her food looked and smelled. So she decided to remain hungry all day. I was heartbroken to listen to these stories happening right here in our community. But it only hit home for me a few months later when my son casually tells me at dinner table that mama, 
I don't think I'm going to take Indian food to school because I think other kids might stare at me. Another student in my class brings oatmeal. She's vegetarian, and some kids stare at her. So just because I had written the first book, we had not solved all the issues. It was just the beginning. So that night, once again, I told them stories about food. And then I went downstairs and I did what every infuriated mom would do. I took those questions to Google and I looked for food. And yes, I found one book in the international market and I ordered it. And then I wrote my second book. Yet again, best-selling, award-winning children's book. I titled it, I Love Curry, and I'm Not Sorry. <laughs> Yet again, the story is based on a character named Rafa, who takes his favorite Indian food to school, despite what other kids thought. As a family, we are learning and growing every day through our lived experiences. We are inspired by the stories in our community and we strive to inspire our community. Before this transformation journey, if we had that conversation at the dinner table and my son would have complained to take Indian food to school, if that happened 10 years ago, I would have told him, that's fine. What is everybody bringing to lunch? Let's give you that. Let's assimilate. But we were on this transformation journey. So before this, exper before this whole experience and this transformation journey, I would describe my son as a child of few words. But today, I see him participating in the world with, the, with a renewed level of confidence. And in the process of helping my curious, confident, genius boys, I found my voice. I found the true, my true self. I found an author in me. I found a mama bear who can move mountains. And I broke out of my own shell. And I know that no one can put me down because I belong in spaces that I choose to be in just the way I am. Thank you. Thank you, Erlen. I can't wait to read your books. Next up is Jordan Brooks, who will share a story about building community through art. Being in a community is different than being in community. Being in a community is just a matter of proximity, where being in community is a mutually beneficial and reciprocal exchange. Growing up, I always felt like a kid between spaces. I was born in the Philippines, raised in Pennsylvania, went to Catholic grade school during the week and Baptist church on the weekends. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> My daycare was in one neighborhood, but I would play and, and I, I played and lived in a whole other. All these different spaces always felt like they weren't my own, but somehow I had to figure out how to navigate them. 
my mother's side of the family lives in Erie, Pennsylvania, and it's a pretty small town, but I have a very big family. My wife came to a family reunion, or came to a family reunion not knowing that it was that, and she thought the whole block was just this random block party in the city. <laughs> Those are all my cousins, aunts, and uncles, <laughs> right? Being in a family that big, it's easy to feel like you get lost and not necessarily know who you are within that space. On the other side, my dad, his side of the family is in New York City. So if I felt lost in my big family in Little Erie, which is like Davenport size, you know what I felt like being in New York City. Huge skyscrapers, people running up and down the streets, you can definitely just get lost in the sheer size of it all. Oddly enough though, I think I started to figure out who I was being in New York City. I remember I was probably like six or seven years old. It's like my first real solid memory of being there. And we were going to go visit my aunt. And so we're rushing to the train station, right? And I'm just already amazed by the huge buildings and I say, like I said, all the people running by me. And then even like going down the steps and trying to jump over the turn thing where we put the tickets in, right, to get to the train on time. And my dad like, hurry up, get inside before the door closes. All that was already a rush and exciting to me. Then we get into me what was like this little rocket underground and just shoot across the city. I was already amazed then. But then there's this moment going to my aunt's house where the subway actually comes up out of the ground and you can feel this kind of like slow moment as you rise up. And then as we go through the space, the bright light hits coming from out of the darkness of the subway. And as I'm adjusting, I see these huge graffiti murals on the sides of buildings, the bright colors, the lines, the words that I can barely make out, and the random images were just so huge and so grand to me, I was amazed. I asked my dad, I was like, what is that? And how did people actually get up there to go even do that in the first place? And he starts to let me know about the history of graffiti. And he told me, son, this is how people said that I am here. I finally found my answer. Where do I belong? Wherever I'm able to leave my mark. Graffiti opened my interest into art and creativity. And after that moment, I actually noticed all the graffiti all around me, from the Sharpie markers that were on the backs of seats to the other walls and buildings that I just apparently didn't pay attention to because I was caught between the people as we were moving suddenly my world just opened up. And I said, okay, how can I now say that I'm here? I started drawing and sketching every chance I could, whether it was graffiti letters or some of my favorite cartoon characters like Gargoyles and X-Men and Dragon Ball Z characters, right? Any opportunity I could, I would go ahead and I would start drawing. And what was great to me at that time was my friends and people would recognize it. Folks would come over to my desk and see what I was sketching or come and kick it with me over at the lunch table and see what I was drawing, right? To even my parents putting me into the art center and the teachers and faculty there would say, hey, you should actually put this in an exhibition. My mom is actually my first collector. <laughs> she would hang pieces on the refrigerator and in the different, on the walls of my house. She literally has pieces that she will not let me take back. Right? But there was something about being able to be seen and be recognized and be felt that was so important to me. So I went to college and I studied art and psychology. And while I was in college, I worked at a court appointed um, youth center. Typically the kids who would go to that youth center, they got in trouble. So they probably did something like painted some graffiti on the side of somebody's building. Thank you, Dad, for not letting me be one of those people who did that. <laughs> um, but yeah, so I worked at this space, and I would sit and talk with the kids, and it was hard for them to open up and talk with me. But I noticed any time I sat down with pens, paper, um, and pencils, and I would sit and draw with them, they would talk more. The characters, which were just like Sonic and other Nickelodeon shows, were actually representatives for their, their friends or their family, and they would explain different stories about themselves to me through the artwork that they created. 
this was the first time that I really noticed that art could, wasn't just me being able to say that I'm here, but for other folks to explain who they are as well too. So I became fascinated with questions of who am I and what do I want to say? What do I want to be? What is the future that I imagine for myself? And how can I explore that and explore that with other people through art? Eventually, I graduated from there and got my first job down in Georgia at a university and I was working in the residence halls. And so I was responsible for creating community and different events where folks could get to know each other and get to know themselves and have a good time. Somehow, I convinced the university to let me build some moving graffiti walls. And I could wheel them across campus and take them all over the place. And I would ask questions like, tell me about your day. Um, where did you come from? Who are you? What do you want to be? What do you hope to, uh, how do you hope to impact the world? And students would write and draw all types of random different images, quotes and phrases and pictures explaining about themselves in that space. For me, it made me realize in that moment, art is not just an exploration again of who we are, but it can help build communities and spaces where people can come together to understand each other more deeply. After I left Georgia Southern, I moved to Iowa, which was pretty different. <laughs> a lot colder. I had gotten used to being down in Georgia, right? Um, but I moved to Iowa, and I didn't have that same artistic community that I had started to build while I was down at the university. And as soon as I was getting kind of comfortable here, COVID happened. Just, yeah, right? <laughs> But COVID happened. And so now I was definitely separated from the people who I had started to build some relationship with. But what did I do? I decided, let's start a virtual draw from life group. And so on Saturdays, I would get together with different folks over Zoom, and we would meet for about an hour or two hours, and we would just sit, talk, enjoy each other, be in community, and draw. I told folks, bring whatever it is that you want to work on. I don't have a prompt. I don't have anything that I expect for us to create. We're just being able to spend this time. Some of the most meaningful and beautiful relationships that I've been able to establish here in Iowa have came from that group. Like one of my friends, Dan. Now, Dan, I had never met this man before. Again, it was only over Zoom, right? But we spent so much time going back and forth with each other over our different ideas that we started to build up a really strong and good connection. When COVID finally settled down and we were able to be outside again, I ended up actually getting my first mural down on 23rd and University on the side of Lefty's Music. And Dan actually came down to help me. So if you would look at the mural, there's some folks who are playing instruments. That's all his work right there. Being able to create that group showed me that regardless of the spaces that we're in, if we can use art, it can become a vehicle to bring folks who have no connection to each other together within the same space. From that virtual meeting group, they became text messages. I started sharing weekly messages with all the folks who were within my virtual community, inspiring each other to just continue to create and to continue to do the things that we found to be the most important to us. From that text community, I actually got inspired now to get a studio space. Me and my wife are down at Mainframe Studios just across the way. Thank you. Where we get to actually create the space that the little kid in me who has always felt like he was caught between spaces was looking to actually make. So now I'm so excited to be able to build these types of places where folks can come and think about those same questions that I had. Who am I? Where do I belong? Who are the people that I need around me? What do I want to do? How do I want to impact the world? And they get to do that through art and creativity with each other. Now, what's also even more amazing is I can call my dad and say, hey, I just painted on the side of a wall. 
but it's cool because they paid me to do it. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Jordan, for building community one piece of art at a time. Our next storyteller is Kenny Gaskin, who will talk about building his own community. Back in 2003 in Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, fifth grade me lived a carefree life like most kids. I went to school, did my homework, and played tons of neighborhood games. Unlike most kids, I loved school. I was a sad kid on snow days. I learned for the sake of learning, though it helped that I had some incentive to doing well in school. My stepdad would give me $25 for every A on my report card. I got straight A's all the way through. <laughs> in class, we play games, do science projects, and read classic books like Hatchet and the Boxcar Children. I don't know if it was my academic performance or me being me, but my teacher made me feel special. I get special trinkets, help her out a lot, and get to work at her desk often. One girl would even call me a glory hogger because of all the praise and attention that I received. <laughs> One day near the end of that fifth grade year, I remember my teacher, Mrs. Layton, looking at me and saying something along the lines of, you're gonna be someone in this world. Those words stuck with me, especially as a quiet kid. I spent the next few years in tune with the school community. Fast forward to January 2008, my younger brother and I boarded a March bus with my dad, who lived in Iowa, for a permanent move to Bettendorf. It was the only option for us, as my mom's relationship with her boyfriend turned south. Here I was, in a totally new community, a wider community. It was a culture shock. I felt out of place and never really fit in with the majority white school. I deliberately distanced myself from some of my black peers. I dressed a certain way, never used profanity, rarely spoke, and had zero interest in drugs or alcohol. I might have been depressed. I might have been depressed. Um, my family didn't have a lot, but I was determined to find purpose and belonging and break the cycle of poverty that so many black and brown families endure in America. When it came time to think about college, I questioned what my future had in store for me. I wondered what community I'd belong to during and after college. I wondered who I'd spend time with and what I would do with my life. You see, role models for kids like me usually consisted of athletes, entertainers, and civil rights icons. I looked up to people like Martin Luther King Jr., basketball player Kevin Garnett, and several rappers. I never had a black teacher or knew of any black professionals. Fewer than 2% of our country's teachers are black men. I'm a part of that count. About eight years ago, I became a teacher in Des Moines Public Schools. As a December graduate, I subbed for a while in the spring of 2016 and got a long-term subbing position in April 2016. When I started, I never asked what happened to the classroom teacher. I was just happy to have a classroom to call my own for a while. People were saying things like, are you sure you want to do this? <laughs> and good luck. <laughs> I just smiled and nodded. But it was clear on that first day that it would be a challenge. Students were fighting, yelling, screaming, daydreaming, you name it. And seven of the 24 students had behavior goals. Thankfully, admin supported the room with one to two additional staff members that rotated in and out every hour or so. They co-taught with me, but our main focus was restoring the classroom community. When it came time for teaching, I connected lessons to students' lives and maintained a sense of my calm and understanding self, as opposed to going in there like Miss Trunchbull from Matilda. <laughs> we rebuilt that community through one-on-one -on -one conversations with students, whole class recess games, lunch with students, fictional writing, and literature circles. It wasn't easy, but we got the class on track. I went into my first official year teaching fifth grade knowing a lot more about community building in a classroom. I was vulnerable with students and speaking about the challenges of my upbringing. We talked about real things, 
things like race, culture, adoption, and the 2016 election. We talked about fun things like Pokemon, video games, and slime making. We did fun things like science projects, the mannequin challenge. And yes, I taught the mandated reading and math lessons by the book. <laughs> Despite decent test scores, it was, clear that this, it was clear that I had a lot to learn about teaching. Being a black teacher in a field dominated by white women isn't easy. I often wonder what my colleagues and the families are thinking. I felt pressure to trust their opinions and ideas instead of my own. For example, I struggled to say something when they suggested skipping slavery lessons in social studies one year. I've grown accustomed to microaggressions, to not receive eye contact during conversations. I felt the need to look and sound professional at all times. And I froze when someone angrily demanded that my students stand and recite the pledge, even though the law says we can't force them to. Despite these things, I've always felt some level of community and purpose in my work. I also see the benefits of being a positive black role model for students. I can be sure that my approach is unlike most they've seen. I've been poor, I've been middle class, I've lived in single parent households and two parent households, I've been discriminated against, witnessed domestic violence, and had family members incarcerated. Community is vital for kids with similar experiences. My second year roster was diverse in several years, or in several ways, but I often overheard students joke about their differences without realizing how hurtful they were being. A dark-skinned girl whose family immigrated from Africa would often get teased about her skin tone. I made sure to be there for her and remind her that black is beautiful. I remember handing her Sharon Flake's award-winning book called Skin I'm In. She looked like the girl on the cover, and I thought reading it would help, would help her become more comfortable in her skin, just as the main character Malika did. You should have seen the smile on her face. She even asked for the book as her promotion gift that students got at the end of the year. Just, my, just like my fifth grade teacher made me feel special, I hope that little girl feel a sense of belonging. Large class sizes, COVID, and personal struggles really affected the middle years of my career so far, but I've enjoyed building with students these last few years. Despite the pay, systemic changes, and proposed changes within the profession, relationships with everybody make it easy to go into work each day. I was reminded of the characteristics and the strength of my community after reading a subnote when I was out a few months ago. She said I had a wonderful group of students who looked out for one another, that she can tell they appreciate my calm and affirming teaching style, to keep doing what I'm doing because it's having a positive impact, and that she'd welcome the opportunity to come back, which is unheard of these days. My first group of students are seniors now, high school seniors now. I've run into some of them and gotten emails from others. They always share how fifth grade was their favorite, how I supported them in staying true to themselves and being leaders. One student is pursuing journalism, while another is doing a missionary outside the US. Early on, I was determined to find purpose and community in my work for my well-being. But as time goes on, that focus has shifted more to ensuring my students feel like they belong. I can't imagine any other career or community to be a part of. That shy, quiet black boy grew up and found his community in a place that fails so many, regardless of race. I'm thankful for my colleagues, the families, and the 20 to 25, um, 9 to 10 year olds that I get to share with each year. Um, my classroom is a home away from home. My students won't remember what I taught them, but I hope they remember how I made them feel, how I urged them to value education and believe in themselves. I hope they find their place in the world and contribute to their communities just like I did. Thank you. Thank you, Kenny. Your students are so lucky to have a teacher like you.
Last but not least, we have Deborah Sveck Karstens, who will share a story on finding community amid hardship. I stepped off the plane in Paris alone. There was no one waiting to greet me. No one holding a sign or flowers or balloons welcoming me to France. I would have to find my own way. It was September 1992, and I was 22 years old. I had left my hometown of Boone, Iowa, everyone and everything I knew, to live in Paris for the next year and work as a nanny, to experience all the City of Light had to offer, and to immerse myself in French after years of studying the language in high school and college. I wandered around the airport in Paris looking for somewhere to exchange my dollars into French francs, and I wondered, what was I thinking? But there was no turning back now. I took a taxi to the apartment where the woman I would be working for greeted me. Quintessentially French, she was tall and slender with dark eyes, dressed head to toe in black, perfectly coiffed, and made up. She and her six-year-old daughter escorted me to my room on the top floor of the building, completely separate from the family's apartment. This tiny room with a ceiling that followed the roof's slope had brown walls, thin brown carpet, a twin-sized bed, a sink, a wardrobe, and one small window. If I stood on my tiptoes, I could see the Eiffel Tower off in the distance. That room would become my sanctuary and my cell. When mother and daughter left, I, I filled the wardrobe with the, the few clothes that I had brought, including a single pair of running tights. I was an introvert who didn't make friends easily. I had struggled to fit in when my um, family moved to Boone in the middle of my fourth grade year. But at least I had my three siblings and my parents to support me. Mom showed her love with freshly baked chocolate chip cookies and brownies. Dad built me a desk and bookshelves, and he played basketball with my siblings and me. In college, finding and making friends took time, but with the built-in connections of life on campus, it came easier. I attended daily choir rehearsals, and I lived in the dorm with fellow resident assistants. Paris was different. I struggled with loneliness and homesickness. Every day, I forced myself to go out and see the sights of the city in the hours before my nanny duties began. I thrilled at visiting the iconic places that I'd only seen in movies or on TV the Eiffel Tower, Notre Dame, Champs-Élysées, L'Arc de Triomphe. But I longed for someone to share it with, and I quickly grew tired of snapping photos of buildings. Afternoons spent playing Barbies with a six-year-old dragged on, and on, and on. <laughs> Why don't we draw or color? or maybe read a book, I suggested. No, she said, and handed me a Barbie, insisting that I change the doll's clothes yet again. <laughs> Reprimands from her mother brought embarrassment and shame. This rice is overcooked. Or, don't wait for me to tell you to clear the table, Deborah. Or, you let her wear patent leather shoes and a white sweater to play at the park? Every evening, I returned to my room, alone and sometimes in tears, and wrote letters to my family, trying to downplay how miserable I felt most of the time. Finding community in Paris took persistence, but it happened. Within a few weeks, I started French classes at the Sorbonne, and I met other nannies from the States. One of them invited me to join her for a run to run after class at a track near the Eiffel Tower. I discovered the American church in Paris, 
Sunday morning services and Wednesday evening choir rehearsals filled a void and brought a new circle of friends and familiar weekly rituals. I struck up a friendship with a woman my age in the choir. And things with the family got easier. The six-year-old and I got along better. I spent less time trying to persuade her to play something other than Barbies. After about two months in Paris, I finally felt like I was finding my way. But just as I was beginning to stitch together a community, my life was ripped apart. It happened the Saturday after Thanksgiving. Just two days earlier, I had been on the phone with my parents and siblings who were gathered around the table to celebrate the holiday without me. It had been my first holiday away from home. That Saturday, I woke to a cool, sunny morning and headed to the Bois de Boulogne for a run. This is a large park on the outskirts of Paris where I had run alone before. I loved going there because its tree-lined paths and wildness compared to the manicured parks in the city reminded me of a park just a few blocks from my home in Boone. The Bois de Boulogne offered a momentary escape from the constant noise of sirens blaring and Hans ho horns honking and from the smells of garbage, smoke, and fish. But on this day, all the light that I had come to appreciate about the park turned to darkness. As I finished my run, a stranger grabbed me, shoved me into nearby bushes, and sat on top of me. Underbrush dug into my skin. I twisted my legs and torso, trying to escape, and shouted for help. He slapped me across the face, hard. My glasses fell off. He put a filthy hand over my mouth. I gasped for air, the weight of him a boulder on my chest. And then he sexually assaulted me. When he finally stood up, I scrambled to my feet and ran back to the apartment, unable to see the reactions from the people that I ran past. I could taste blood, but I couldn't see my bloody nose or my bruised eye. I didn't notice the tears in my running tights. Unable to hide what had happened or to deal with it alone, I turned to the couple I worked for. Oh, mon Dieu, they both said, qu'est-ce qui se passe? Oh my God, what happened? He handed me a swig of whiskey. Later, he returned with me to the park to find my glasses. She listened as I described what happened and accompanied me up to my room to gather some clean clothes. I showered, wishing the hot water would wash away the morning's events. I wanted to curl up into a ball and disappear. To sleep the rest of the day, to try and forget, to be alone in my shock, my fear, and my shame. Instead, at the urging of the woman I worked for, I reached out to my community. I called my nanny friend and running partner. She came over and held me tightly as I sobbed. She listened. She encouraged me to call a rape crisis line and stood outside the phone booth as I dialed the number. We spent the rest of the day together, wandering around Paris. It feels like everyone is staring at me, I said. Does my face look that bad? She said no, but suggested we slip into a movie theater for an afternoon matinee, where I wouldn't have to worry about being stared at. That evening, she walked me back to the apartment, sensing my fear at returning alone. The next day, Sunday, I forced myself to get up and go to church. I needed the comfort and familiarity of the worship service. After the service, as we hung up our robes, my choir friend pulled me aside and asked me what was wrong. 
She had noticed my black eye despite my best efforts to cover it with makeup. When I broke into tears, she escorted me to a nearby cafe and listened as I repeated my story. She listened to my questions. Why did this happen? Why would God let this happen? I have no memory of what she said, only that her willingness to step into my pain and to pray for me was a comfort to me that day. On Monday, the woman I worked for, who at this point had become much more than just my employer, accompanied me to the police station. She had insisted that I report the crime. Maybe someone else has reported too, she said. Your information could help the police find this man. In the days that followed, I went alone to appointments with a doctor and a psychologist, but I felt the support of those who I had told. The psychologist sat beside me when I called my parents to tell them a version of what had happened, not wanting to worry them or to be forced to return home. I didn't tell them the whole story until years later. I stayed in Paris because I had made a year-long commitment to the family I worked for, and I didn't want to abandon them after only two months. Leaving would mean admitting defeat, failure. I wanted to prove to myself that I could make Paris home. After the assault, a canister of mace became my constant companion. I made sure I always had ID on me in case the police needed to identify my dead body. I begged God to keep me safe every time I walked out the door. And even though I was assaulted in broad daylight, my terror peaked at night, especially on the five block walk from the metro station back to the apartment after an evening out with friends, a distance that felt like miles, but was too short for taxi drivers to bother with. Determined to keep running, I had borrowed a needle and thread and stitch up the tears in my only pair of running tights. In the days and months that followed the assault, I gathered threads and stitched together a community. I welcomed other nannies to Paris and showed them around the city. I joined a young adult group at church where I made connections with other people like me who were curious about their faith. When the family I worked for left town for a week, I invited friends over for dinner. Without having to worry about getting home safely, I could relax and enjoy the evening. We laughed at one another's attempts to flip crepes in a pan and told fish out of water stories about living in Paris. In early spring, I traveled with friends to the painter Claude Monet's home in Giverny. We wandered through rows of irises, azaleas, and peonies, a painting of oranges, purples, reds, and every shade of pink. The pictures I took that day included not only the beautiful gardens, but also my friends. In May 1993, six months after the assault, I celebrated my 23rd birthday. That morning, I returned to the park where I'd been assaulted, this time with my nanny friend by my side. I wanted to prove to myself that I had the courage to return to the scene of the crime, that I was brave, that I had moved forward, and that the man who raped me hadn't stopped me from living. A dozen friends gathered for dinner and cake that evening. For me, it wasn't just a celebration of my birthday, it was a celebration of my becoming and of the community I had stitched together. As the group sang happy birthday, my heart burst open with joy. The morning I left Paris in August 1993, I threw my running clothes in a dumpster, including the running tights I had repaired months earlier. I was alone, again, but I didn't feel alone. The community I stitched together in Paris 
wasn't born of convenience. It was born of time, effort, and a willingness to be vulnerable. I hadn't lost myself after the assault in Paris. I had discovered my own strength, resilience, and vulnerability. I had leaned into community and found myself. Thank you.